Okay, so the, the title of my talk is The Truth About Online Training. And um, I'm gonna start by describing what we know about online uh, training so far from our experiences so far, um, the different benefits and challenges that we have with online training. I'm also gonna tell you what we don't know um, at this point. And um, then I'll provide an overview of the training path for Chose Zen students, including the role of online and in-person training. And then we can do um, questions and answers at the end. We should have plenty of time. So what do we know about online Zen training? We know that um, Samadhi, or the state of relaxed concentration of no self, it, it's cultivated and can be transferred online in the virtual dojo. Um, and we know that students are having breakthroughs and progressing with resolving duality through online training. And some of the experiences that students have described may be unique in terms of um, the uh, unique to the online training env uh, environment. And these include um, transcending the concept of a dojo as a place that you go to train to this moment, whatever you're doing, being one person rather than the person that goes to the dojo to train, um, and then the other person you are in your, your daily life, and expanding their sense of here and now to include the different home dojos connected together across uh, space and time. And White LaRouche has talked about being um, struck by how much more aware she is about the action or the energy of action at a distance when she's training um, online. And one story I wanted to share about this. So um, this was during summer Keishin. Um, I had these um, birds called cedar waxwings and they were getting drunk on fermented berries in the trees outside my house. And you can see them, they're actually pretty famous for this. Um, so they're so they're such uh, big sort of like drunkards. You can find pictures of them on the internet, <laughs> uh, eating their berries and getting drunk. And then they would um, fly kamikaze style um, into my the large windows of my condo. And so during Zazen, I would hear this loud thud. And then um, this would happen multiple times per day. In that year, there was either a bumper crop of these berries or these birds. And um, because nothing like this has ever happened to me, um, it's never, it had never happened before and it hasn't happened since. But some of the birds would survive um, and then some of them didn't. And so during my work period, I had to basically clean up dead bird bodies. Um, and one was hidden under a chair on my balcony and had maggots by the time I found it. And I, I'm sparing you the, the picture um, representation of that, <laughs> um, though it's tempting. Um, and at the time I was working on a koan about where I would go when I die. And this experience gave me um, new depth into that koan. But it was also clear to me that the death, uh, the deaths of all these uh, cedar wax wings impacted the zazen of all the other sashin participants as well, even at a distance and whether they knew about it or not. The felt experience I have of sitting online with you all is that I create the dojo and the community and you create me um, fresh moment by moment. And I leave a different person than when I came. And that part feels like magic to me because when I close my computer, it's like poof, the dojo and the community, they all disappear. And this experience happens 
to me in person as well, but it's less dramatic as you can imagine because you don't all go away when I close my computer. In Zen, we stress um, personal experience as being the only thing of critical importance. We can say that the truth is to be realized within oneself. And from this perspective, the reason why a virtual space can work to train students in Zen is because the truth, or sorry, because the human body is the true Zen dojo. The minimal unit, the minimal necessary unit is the student themselves, not the dojo that they go to. The virtual dojo provides a training structure in the form of a jiki and a schedule. And um, the jiki is the training leader, if you don't know that. Um, and it also provides connection to teachers and a community of other people who are training. Um, and this is all through the wonders of the internet. And these things are critical in terms of creating efficiency. We talk about Zen training as speeding up a natural Zen or natural process, like a natural maturation process. And we do this so that we can be of use to people as soon as possible, rather than waiting to your 85 years old and on your deathbed. And I've talked about the ways that we gain efficiency from training as part of a virtual um, dojo community as I experienced them um, during our last Keishin. Namely, when we've lost our way, our teachers point true north to help us in navigating all four directions. When we've lost coherence, the key eye and breath of our training partners helps us restore resonance and feel whole again. And facing suffering together gives us the courage and the strength to carry on when we might have given up. Green Roshi has talked about how the world that surrounds us now is providing the harsh conditions that rival the most austere and harsh um, atmosphere inside a Rinzai Zen um, temple or monastery. And he's not exaggerating. The actual conditions that we've had during the recent Kishin we've we've held in the past few years have included um, the murder of one of our Zen students named Beth Potter and her husband. The murder of George Floyd and the national unrest that followed in the January 6th insurrection. This is the dojo that we train in. And Green Roshi has said that we don't need to create severe conditions. We only need to recognize that these conditions exist in the world around us, to hear and take responsibility for the cries of the world. And then the objective of our zazen becomes to end suffering, to end the fear, to end the ignorance, and to end the sense that we are separate from all of the world that surrounds us. White Law Roshi has said, we're creating a vessel using the technology of our time to support one another to do the inner alchemy so that the outer transformation is possible. So what are the specific benefits of online training? I'm gonna start with my favorite part. And that is that the virtual dojo is a kind of laboratory. It's a place for innovation, a place for experimentation and trying new things. We're literally inventing contemporary Zen technology and trying things that we might not otherwise try in a traditional training environment. And there's a lot of freedom and creativity in that. One example is our online intensive training that we call Keishin. And this follows a different schedule than in-person session and inc includes some different activities. He hexagrams are six word poems. And these were a new art form that Green Roshi um, created 
um, in an attempt to get people anchored into their senses during Kishin. And the talks that we did give it, um, during Kishin, which we call Keisho, um, we varied the format a lot, including the use of movie clips, music, and visuals, which are also different than the in-person um, Keishos that we give. And all of this adaptation and experimentation is helping us, or at least me, um, gain a deeper understanding about the underlying principles of Zen training and how to create the right conditions in any time and any place. Another benefit of the virtual dojo is that it allows a broader reach to new students across the US and even on different continents. We have people joining us today, I think from um, Japan and um, Canada and different states. We also um, have um, enabled people who've trained um, and taken trainings with our um, lay sister organization, the Institute for Zen Leadership, to continue and deepen their training uh, with us. And we recognize that training online may, be, may provide a better on-ramp for new long distance students than jumping into an in-person session or a live-in um, training for the first time. Many long-term Chose Zen students live outside of Wisconsin. And these long distance students who've been training for years on their own um, were probably the first to acknowledge the benefits of online training. And these included more frequent interactions with teachers, increased consistency and accountability through training uh, with a community, and ability to participate in more intensive training opportunities with reduced travel costs, time uh, lost at work or with their families. Through the virtual dojo, these long distance students and teachers have the opportunity to serve the community in ways that weren't possible before. And I'm an example of that. I live in Atlanta and I help run the virtual dojo, um, even though Chose Zen is based in Wisconsin. The different um, leadership opportunities we have online in terms of leading daily zazen or intensive training um, as the jiki or other roles that we have are probably one of the best tools that we have to help students develop clear ki and make progress in their training. And we have a lot of evidence of this progress. I'll also note that even for students in Wisconsin, online training has helped those who are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19 or have other limitations to participate in Zen training without worry. And I've observed um, that as a community, including long distance members, we're, we're able to get, uh, we're more connected than we ever have been before. And this allows us when we do get together in person um, to get into a rhythm with each other um, much faster, I think, than before. Other ways that online training can help students um, complement their in-person training is that remote training can help students take more responsibility for their training. We talk about students being their own jikis um, rather than relying on the structure of an external uh, physical dojo. And let's be real, essentially because we've brought Zen training into your home, you have no excuses now for not, for not doing Zen training. And relatedly because, um, relatedly online training has helped um, bring uh, Zen training into the world where students now can take care of their homes like they do the dojo and they can care for their household members like they would their teachers and their training partners. And we also, many of us also recognize that the home um, and work situations that we encounter every day create their own cons and serve as mirrors for how we're not measuring up. So what are some of the challenges of training online. One challenge is that students can be more sloppy or lazy online. 
The jiki doesn't notice if you move your foot off the screen and they don't know what you're really doing um, during your work period. So some students may try to get away with things that they wouldn't normally get away with if they were um, training online or training in person. In her advice on being your own jiki, White Law Roshi has talked about being a kind of gentle, tough with her with yourself. And I think it was, you know, really good advice. But I also want to acknowledge that beginning students may too often err on the side of being too gentle and not push themselves hard enough. Because a lot of fears creep up that cause people to hold back. And in person, there's no escape from that kind of thing. And having the external discipline and encouragement of a dojo, jiki, and teachers at your disposal is often helpful for breaking through uh, fears. Another thing is that teachers and jikis can't make the same type of physical corrections that they would if you were in person. Um, we talk about the concept of mutual polishing, which occurs between dojo members. And this is essentially having your habits pointed out to you. And this doesn't happen as much online. It's either because it's harder to diagnose or adequately address, or because it's too disruptive to keep um, calling out individuals in the context of group training, or maybe just because it doesn't match online. In training online, it's also harder to cultivate a deep state of mushin or no mind. Um, when you can't really get away from your computers or your cell phones or your spouse or or your daily schedule, um, et cetera. When we fully immerse ourselves in the physical uh, training environment without devices and other distractions, it's easier to have the experience of being time and to let the waves uh, settle on your ocean. Compared to training in person, online training can also feel a bit flat because we're missing a lot of the um, sensory elements that we have in person. Historically, Zen training occurred in the context of a community um, in, in places that were explicitly designed to draw upon the senses. And our style of Zen training um, also emphasizes the physical and ki or energetic components. And that vibrational resonance is, is more challenging to tap into online. Online, it's nearly impossible to create the classical experience that emerges at some point, point during an in-person session where being part of the group feels like being part of the school of fish. A bell rings and you all bow at the same time or you turn um, at the same time. Um, or sometimes during a kinhin, which is what we call walking meditation, you feel like you're the legs of the same caterpillar with a felt sense of being connected, um, hara to hara or abdomen um, to abdomen. A group ki does get built online that has palpable strength, but it lacks the same physicality that I'm talking about. We know that back and forth interactions work well online, so we end up relying more on words than we would in person. And this has all been helpful. But online encounters, as we're currently able to have them, are still very crude. We have a pixelated image that's lacking in quality, in, in details and subtle expressions, and we recognize this as a person we know. And then we have a series of one-way interactions with this picture, but it's kind of similar to talking on a walkie-talkie, right? Like if you both talk at the same time, you cancel each other out. So we've grown accustomed to listening very closely and intensely to each other and making it count when it's your turn to speak. Green Roshi has said that despite the limitations, he's observed that online interaction online interactions can be that much more meaningful and intense. And that is because there's a hunger to connect. 
meaning that both speakers and lis listeners poured all of themselves into the encounter, knowing that it was the only channel available. The metaphor he used was that it was like being shipwrecked on a deserted island and catch, casting out a message in a bottle, a very narrow channel for communication, but very intense. And most of us have had that kind of experience in the virtual dojo where we've sent out a signal and we've had it, uh, we've had it heard on the other end and we felt how life affirming that is. So in terms of what we still don't know about online training, in, term, in the spirit of uh, full transparency, we've only been doing online Zen training for two years and four months. Beyond that, we have no proven track record. We know that online training has helped existing students progress in their training. And if you have even completed their formal training this way, Quite a few new people have also had formative experiences, but we don't yet know if somebody can um, go from starting to completing their formal Zen training online. You're welcome to try and become the first. But even if you did, uh, we still don't know whether a teacher would feel comfortable qualifying you as having had the same experience as them without ever having spent time with you in person. And it's also unlikely that the end result in terms of your psychophysical posture and ki or energy that you develop would be the same as if you trained in person. And it's still not clear that we'll be able to develop the full repertoire of training modalities and feedback needed to adequately convey this piece online, but we'll, endeav we'll endeavor to, to try. So, Next, I'm going to shift to um, articulating a training path for Chosei Zen students. A starting point for this was that um, we recognize that we've always had long distance Zen students. These are people who train on their own and with a group and their teacher um, when, whenever they're able. And this is a proven format that works with a pace largely driven by the student themselves. And, as expected, you get what you put into it. And no distinction has historically been made based on where the student lives. The training works the same and the training path has always been um, customized in collaboration between a, a teacher and a student and considering the student's different life circumstances. So for reasons of parity, we're saying that there's no online students. There are only Zen students, uh, period. We have many great online resources, classes, um, talks, et cetera. And um, for those of you who are not near our dojo, and we're encouraging all students to train in person at the dojos in Spring Green and um, Madison, Wisconsin and Rhode Island. Uh, when they can. So from this perspective, all students are either in person or a hybrid of online and in person or aspiring to be a hybrid at some point in the future. And we encourage all students to work directly with a Zen teacher, either um, informally or formally to figure out their path whenever they're ready. But I wanna be clear, there are no specific requirements around uh, in-person training. It's largely based on the needs of the student. For example, people who live far away are probably going to come less frequently than people who live nearby. And there's no shame in that. And if this discussion is um, starting to make you feel worried, I'll give you the advice my PhD advisor gave to me um, which was, it's your career. And he would say this to me anytime I asked him to take a long vacation or if I really had to do something I didn't wanna do. But the point being that um, it's on you. No one's gonna make you do anything that you don't wanna do. And you need to take responsibility for your own Zen training path, just like you do everything else. 
And I recognize that this is um, liberating and a burden all at the same time, because I've been there. <laughs> um, I'll share at this point that many of our students who've started online during the pandemic have completed um, Keishin and Zazenkai. Um, quite a few have become formal Zen students by choosing a Sanzen teacher. Uh, several have actually completed in-person Sashin. And we had one student who did um, a long, uh, several week live-in period at Daiko Zenji in Madison, Wisconsin. So I'm gonna show you a new website that we've created. Okay, so here's the website. And this out outlines what the training path might look like uh, for new Zen students. And I can put this in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna run through the different components now, which you can think of a, as the progression for new students. But in reality, many of them will run in parallel as you um, progress in your training. So the introduction to Zazen is the class that we'd like all new Chosei Sen student, students to start with. Um, it covers the, the basics of um, our style of Rinzai Zen uh, meditation, Zazen. It covers Hara breathing and the different training opportunities um, available that we offer. Um, this class occurs um, online every Sunday. You need to register. And all students, including those who train online and in person, um, can join it. I also believe that um, people in Madison can also arrange to have um, an in-person inter introductory class as well. The next item uh, we called personal training, and this acknowledges that students need to bring their own motivation and cultivate a practice of daily zazen on their own, um, building up to 45 minutes at a time. And we recommend sitting twice daily in the morning and the evening. And continuing Zen students um, should work on developing their hara, practicing okyo, and training in the ways like a martial or fine art or another practice um, that they determine uh, with their teacher. We have quite a few resources available on the website to support students in their own training. Group training or training in, as part of a community is helpful for creating intensity, in, intensity and consistency. And we have daily Zazen that's offered online and in person in Madison. We also have group Okyo in person classes and online classes and periodic talks and webinars to help support um, students in their training. And then to boost um, your training and break habits, we also encourage students to join periodic um, in-person or online intensive trainings. And we offer one day or overnight Zazen Kai, um, four and seven day Seshin and four day Keishin. Seshin, they happen in person four times per year. In Keishin, they happen online um, in the spring and the fall, so two times per year. Zazen Kai have been happening, I believe, monthly in Madison. In um, online Zazen Kai, we usually offer in the months ramping up to or um, down from a Keishin. And you can check the calendar um, periodically to see the latest schedule. Um, and this week, we're going to add more online Zazen Kai and future um, Sashin as well. The prerequisites for intensive training are the ability to sit for 45 minutes at a time without moving and to perform basic kata breathing. And previous experience or approval of a teacher is also often required. Sanzen is the interview between a student and a teacher and it's often centering on a student's koan or the question that your teacher gives you. Students can choose a teacher for Sanzen after completing two Keishin or Seshin, and some uh, teachers offer online Sanzen. It's at this point that a student becomes a formal Zen student. 
And because of this, um, San Zen represents a level of commitment to Zen training. So it's not mandatory, but it's recommended. Additionally, many students find it helpful to um, do different trainings with our lay sister organization, the Institute for Zen Leadership. Live-in training on a longer term basis is possible at Dai Kozenji in Madison. We have a three-year priest curriculum that has an annual application process. And we also plan to offer a level one instructor or Jiki training um, annually with the next one um, occurring this fall. We've done one, one so far online. And this training qualifies you to be a Jiki and with approval to run your own sitting program or sitting group. Um, a level two training um, for leading intensive training is being developed and should be available next year. Based on interests, we'd also like to support people that are training remotely and want to start their own sitting group. And as the group matures, we can even um, consider having a, a teacher come out um, and help you support Zazen Kai or even offer um, a seminar. So I want to close that um, by acknowledging that for many of us, our lives are still being impacted by the pandemic and may be changed somewhat permanently, resulting in more people and people being more isolated than they were before the pandemic. Like for me, my job um, went, went to being remote two and a half years ago. Um, and it may end up staying this way or definitely being different than what it was, which was working in an office uh, five days per week. And I think a lot of people have had that experience. Other people may still not have gained back the breadth of their social circle, or they may have lost uh, meaningful um, groups that they were part of in person or activities. And they may be suffering from that. And other people may be fatigued from increased um, caretaking responsibilities or just being with the same household members every day. And I've noticed that um, many people seem to be um, talking more about how to create meaningful co um, connection and community um, than they, weren't, they once were. So for these reasons, the idea of starting an in-person um, sitting group May, more, may feel more relevant to you um, and other folks, um, you know, your communities included. So with that, um, I'd be happy to take questions. I've given you a lot of information. And um, I also wanna recognize that we have um, White Law Roshi here, who was um, like me, um, a long-term, or sorry, yeah, like long-term, um, long-distance um, Zen student and is now, you know, a long-distance teacher. And um, this is her dojo. So she has a lot of relevant experience to bear and may want to make some comments of her own. And we have Kiel Rishi here who runs um, Daiko Zenji in Madison um, and is, um, he may want to set, um, add some things as well about what um, he might be able to offer you in the way of um, in-person training. So White Law Roshi or Kiel Roshi, do you want to say anything? Um, thank you, Scobie Roshi. Uh, the, uh, you know, I think the feeling I just have is gratitude that um, gratitude that um, this training has allowed us to connect and at a time when connection became so important. Um, gratitude that it got rolling, gratitude for your leadership to continue it. And it has been such a help to um, anchor people's training when, boy, do we need to train? <laughs> do we need to train? So um, the uh, so thank you 
for all the leadership you've brought to it and for your explanations tonight about what we do and don't know, what we do and haven't tried yet, and, and how we'll keep discovering this together. Um, Ryan Roche, I invite you as well to, to make any comment about it. It says, I recall this, uh, this whole process started with you saying, you know, I think we have to start sitting online every day. You want to add anything? Oh, you're good. Kyo Roshi, anything from you? We loved rubbing elbows at Daiko Zenshi a few weeks oh. ago. Boy, was that nice. Yeah, we, we just had uh, hosted, you know, many, many, you know, at least a few of you here at Daiko Zenji in Madison. And just one thing that really struck me and really blew me away is the the evidence of the quality of the training by supporting each other through the virtual dojo. There's a typical, almost comedic play that I'm used to observing play out at the start of Sashin, where you have all these people coming in and a lot of them maybe haven't been really training that much. And just sort of like, everyone's, you know, like, what are my cushions like? And, and, uh, and this didn't happen this last session. And, and a number of the people that attended, this was their first in-person training. And I really attribute that to the consistency and the accountability that you guys hold for each other, uh, training together, you know, even though there's great distances, you know, separating you. And the motivation of that, you know, is just, you know, you guys motivate each other. And then when you do meet, it's just, it's just so wonderful. It's like already a well-oiled machine. And I would like to you know, just like really stress like what Scobie Roshi, like you guys are really the, the pilots of your own Zen machine, your training machine. And that, you know, it's like these things what are listed are not like, these are not requirements. It's like, you guys are all underneath, you know, you you drive yourselves. It's just that, you know, the big thing is that, you know, you guys are welcome. You guys are welcome to try these other, other modalities of training. And um, like, it's not like you must do this and do that. It's just more like, Hmm, this is an option. And if you, if there's a, a hunger for more to try something else, it's like, go for it. You know, don't hold back. But, you know, that's, that's all I have to say. It's just, it's nice to see your faces again. And, uh, and thank you very much, Scobie Roshi. So wonderful. Yep. Thanks. Thank you both. And it may sound like a joke to say this, but, um, uh, Ryan Roshi and uh, Patelli Sensei are in their street clothes, so I didn't recognize them <laughs> in their official capacities. I just recognized them as my friends. But <laughs> do you have anything to um, say, Ryan Roshi or Patelli Sensei? Okay. Um, we also, I'm also reminded um, from hearing Kiel Roshi speak that um, Ted Smith just got back from doing his first in-person um, session and he had previously com uh, completed Keishin. I don't know, Ted, do you want to say anything about your experience? <clears throat> well, it was really amazing. Um, it was really hard, um, but I'm glad I did it. Um, I'm still processing it, really. Um, but just to echo, I think what Kiel Roshi um, said, I don't think there's any way I could have I could have had that experience without without the virtual dojo and the 90 day sort of lead up to and the and Keishin. Um So I guess yeah, both. I mean, both the virtual dojo and the and the fact that I was able to get up to 
to the Sishin and, and also just did the Zazenkai uh, this past Friday um, because it's only a two hour drive for me. Um, so I am able to do a hybrid and uh, I, I'm just getting so much and I, I have so much gratitude for having having found this, this community. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks. So who else um, wants to either comment or has a question? I think you're exactly right. <laughs> the first time we ever did a caching, I think my remarks were that I felt like a space and time traveler. And I wasn't exaggerating. I had such a bigger feeling than I normally had in terms of being able to perceive across the boundaries of space and time. Yes. And a kind of and it was basically my koan for a while. Like the koan I would ask myself was, um, what is not here and now? Because it's almost like infinite, right? It's like, it's such a better question than what is here and now, right? <laughs> because it's like, woo, when I ask myself that question, it's like it everything just comes real big, you know? And and you're right that that this virtual dojo, you know, has given me that experience. Um I think you're exactly right. Like it's opened my eyes a lot more to kind of the more subtle pieces, you know, that are beyond physicality, which is what we really emphasize in our um tradition yeah i mean i think people could sign up for jiki <laughs> duty <laughs> and not make it so that i have to remind everybody every month <laughs> that, that would be good good <laughs> um and if people have ideas like you came up with, I think the 90 day training idea, and that was a huge success. So I think whatever you guys have, please bring it. And um, I've gotten a huge charge out of um, helping, you know, the Jikis or participating in the Jiki conversations and Jiki training. Um, and also working with Jikis, you know, and mentoring one on one when we're doing the um, when we're doing the session or the Keishin online and Zazenkai. So um, keep bringing your enthusiasm, you know, sign up for things. It's really to your benefit. I've just seen um, basically remarkable. I, I've I've had it myself. I think I was the 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 first Jiki for the first ever uh, Keishin. Um, so I know how transformative that experience can be both in myself and in I've, I've seen it in others as well. So um, yeah, please do your thing, um, sign up for things and keep bringing uh, fresh ideas that we can put into practice. Two things. One is um, we're talking about having another Jiki in instructor level one training. And then the idea has come up again to have like an every other month um, meetup of the Jikis. And I'm hopeful that it will be, be for real again. I know we did like three and then we said we would continue, but we never did. Um, the other idea that um, Ryan Roshi is raising to me is that we have this advisory group for the virtual dojo that has kind of um, gone fallow a bit, and maybe I can expand that um, for people who are interested. Um, that would be good as well. I think having the new energy would give me energy, to be honest. Yeah. I'm so glad that you asked this question because this is the part that 
I've been the most worried about. Um, I, I don't know if you know, but for 10 years, I basically worked um, only in international settings. Um, so I traveled 50% of the time and I was basically flying around the world. And, you know, those were my colleagues. Like, basically I interacted with a lot of um, international folks and I'm familiar with many different contexts. And so thinking about, you know, how reasonable really is it um, that we would expect people to come in, in person and then how often are we expecting them to come and all these kinds of questions um, that you're raising, you know, the costs and, and, you know, time lost from work and all these different things. And you're raising a good point too about environmental impact, which is something, you know, I think a lot maybe more about now, given that we, we've, we've demonstrated, you know, at work that we can get a lot, a lot of things done, you know, just through these Zoom meetings, then, um, you know, we, we probably would have known before the pandemic. We did so many things by just flying there and doing the job. Um, I think your intuition about going for a longer period makes a lot of sense to me. Um, like going either choosing a longer uh, session, like the summer and the winter ones are longer, um, and then potentially like tacking on a week, you know, before or afterwards. And that's something that um, Kiel Rushi um, offered this past time. Um, to some folks, and I imagine he might offer again. I don't know, Kiel Roshi or others, do you want to add anything in terms of addressing Kelly's question? Yeah, I would, I would say that that's something to, you know, discuss with your teacher. And um, these are, you know, we're, all of us are kind of like coordinated to help each other in that, like, um, uh, for example, we didn't do as good a job broadcasting and, and letting people know as we probably could have, but for example, leading up to summer session, we had a, a intensive live in period where a number of people had committed to coming and it's sort of like you start training for like a good week before session happens. And then there's always the opportunity for some people, if they want, they can, you know, stay for a day or two afterwards or something like that. The long as it's coordinated beforehand. My my first session was a week long session, and um, I I almost kind of you know it's like whether one long or short is better. I I almost I'm not sure if. If I just did a short session, if I would have ever came back again, I mean, for me, the, the week long session, it was just so much, it was so epic that, you know, there was parts of it where it's like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through it. And then you have a, some sort of a breakthrough where all of a sudden it's sort of like, wow, it's like couldn't, couldn't describe. So it's like, it's true that we have a fall session that is geared more towards, you know, beginners and that we spend more time explaining, more time teaching. And then, you know, typically the week long session is less talking. It's more just, just train hard, not as much talking. And, you know, it's sort of like you have to kind of trust your own intuition and also if you're not sure talk to a teacher and you know hash it out but you know if someone has been training online and done caching and been really devoted you know maybe a week long and then if on top of it maybe a week before you know so there's ways to get sort of like more bang for your buck i guess you'd say <laughs> yeah i think uh next summer will be a much more broader because it's one of those things where like 
when when you're kind of just living in and doing a daily live-in routine the more people that are training together and you know the more powerful that is and then all that more ready you know it's almost like you you're in that state that a lot of people don't get into until towards the end of session but you're already in that state before session happens so it's um yeah i think we'll we'll do a a better job of broadcasting it as an opportunity earlier in advance for for next summer for folks that want to have you know not just a session but time before as well the last questions or comments Patelli sensei any closing comments oh i just want to thank you very much uh, two different experiences between you know virtual and in person, and certainly in person is uh, yeah very very rewarding. And the week before <laughs> was uh, even I feel Roshi was very about beginning in in a in a better frame of mind when you're you know there earlier, you know to get into a rhythm. And um, kind of like you're, you're ahead of the game. So, but anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I just came back from the in-person session as well. So I got to be um, shoulder to shoulder with Kiel Roshi, White Law Roshi, Patelli Sensei, um, Ted and others. and. I got to meet um, my student, Justin, who lives in um, San Diego for the first time, which was um, so special, even though we've been um, doing Sanzen online together. Um, it was really a completely different experience to have um, Sanzen in person. And um, I got to see him, you know, walk out of there with a different body at the end, which was really, really cool. Um, and, you know, I got to, uh, you know, fix his zazen and take away his knee cushion. And um, <laughs> Patelli Sensei and I worked with him on, um, you know, his his kiai at Kiel Roshi too. So, I mean, this was really, to me, really, illustrative of how the two things can be complementary. Like Kiel Roshi said, we weren't starting from zero because he's been training online for um, two and a half years um, Zen um, training, and he's been doing kendo on his own for four years. So he definitely wasn't starting from zero, and we really got to uh, pack a lot in um to his session experience which i think he really benefited from so um i thank you guys all for coming and participating and um i appreciate you all very much um so thank you for being here um and i hope you stay safe and i'll see you online in the future <laughs>